Hey guys, welcome to Artifact Alley. I'm Christy Dunn. I'm the registrar here at the History Museum. Today we are going to talk about this gentleman right here. He is a 1943 standard diving dress. Um, most of you probably are more familiar with the term diving suit. He is on display right as you walk in in our Manufacturing Victory exhibit. Now this exhibit is about so much more than just manufacturing items. It is specifically about the local companies in the South Bend area, South Bend, Elkhart, Mishawaka, that produced items to be used during conflicts. And we start, you know, uh, with the Revolutionary War and work our way up to present day. It is the first exhibit that the History Museum and the Studebaker National Museum have done in conjunction with each other. And so if you come visit it, you will actually get to start off in our hallway, see the first part over at the Studebaker Museum, and then come on over for the grand finale here at the History Museum. But along with talking about these items, we also talk about you know, the people that made them and the people involved. And, you know, what better than to talk about something that an actual person was in? Uh, and, you know, I always like to include that fun little fact, that fun little, um, you know, collections curatorial fact. And today, I wanted to point out that this guy's in front of a really big window. And you guys know that, you know, as we're little kids, we're constantly told light is bad for artifacts. Well, not all light's the same. And so you have UV light, UVA, UVB, um, and you also have shields for these things. So what's really damaging to artifacts is the UV light. And, but you know, we still like light. We like to be able to see outside every once in a while. So these windows that were built into the gallery, we put film on it that even though it doesn't look like it's really tinted or anything, it protects and keeps out 98% of UV light. So it is actually safe to have this guy standing right here in front of it, walk by at night, see the big figure in the window. Um, so that's today's fun little fact. Now back onto this guy. He is a very big guy. Um, and this suit was actually made to be extra large and kind of you know, baggy on the guy who wore it. And that's because it is made of a waterproof canvas and rubber. And so it's not very warm. The guy would actually have to uh, layer up with warmer clothes underneath. So it's baggy so that all of that actually can fit in there. And why it's in this exhibit, this is rubber right here on the cuffs. You have rubber up here. And these were produced by US Rubber, which most of you actually know as ball band. And that factory eventually in Mishawaka became the Uniroyal plant. So U.S. Rubber uh, had their factory in Mishawaka, Indiana. And in the 1940s, they were the largest producer of these suits in the country, if not the world. They had a major contract with the military, but these were also used by divers who were um, cleaning up under the water or who were um, you know, taking surveys under the water. So they had a lot of different uses. Now, the diving suit is actually a lot older than you might realize. It dates all the way back to the 1400s. In 1405, a gentleman named Conrad Kaiser actually described a diving dress made of a leather jacket and a metal helmet with two glass windows. The jacket and the helmet were lined by a type of sponge, and that was meant to retain the air. Uh, and then there was a leather pipe that was connected to a bag of air. In 1511, a diving suit design was actually illustrated in a book by Vigidius, which is sometimes also pronounced Vigitius. Uh, he's 
Roman, and quite frankly, I pronounce it both ways. So he illustrated a diving suit based off of Conrad Kaiser's description. In 1690, so about um, almost 200 years later, the Thames Divers, a short-lived London diving company, gave public demonstrations of a Vigidius type shallow water diving dress. And then in, in 1797, a full diving dress was finally designed. Um, the design consisted of a large metal helmet and a similarly large metal belt connected by a leather jacket and trousers. So as you can see, that basic design made its way all the way to our current design. So coming back to the suit itself, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the pieces and it all starts with the helmet. As you heard way back in the 1400s, it started with that metal helmet and just a leather jacket. And the idea is to keep people breathing and you know, alive in that fashion and thought was not given to the whole body for a little while. This actual helmet was designed in um, 1823 roundabout and originally had nothing to do with water whatsoever. Charles and John Dean, brothers, had witnessed um, a large fire and they saw the firemen going in and out. And of course, smoke inhalation is one of the leading causes of death with fire. And they wanted to create something that would allow the firefighters to go in and supply them with oxygen so that they could stay in longer, work on getting rid of the fire, putting it out and also saving people. So they used the design from the 1400s and came up with their own version. And what we have on here is a brass and copper helmet. And those were two of the main materials that this was designed with. What we have back here, there is a leather hose attached to the back, which was meant to supply the oxygen. And there is a valve on the other side of the helmet which would let gases escape. So this was created for firefighters and a few years later, they decided to adapt it for diving itself. And with that, or because of that, Charles and John Dean actually ended up creating the very first diving manual. And that is really what started what we think of today as modern diving. The helmet is uh, broken up into two parts. You can see the seam right here that sort of splits it. The top is called the bonnet and the bottom is called the corselet. And you would have um, descriptions based off of what it has. So you have these bolts here that attach to the rubber underneath, which actually has two flaps to keep it watertight and airtight. So this helmet up here is described actually by the uh, features that you see on it. On the, the bonnet part of the helmet, you have the vision ports of which this helmet has four. One, two, three, and you guys can't see it very well, but there's a fourth one right on top there. And then on the corselet part, there are bolts, which were also used to describe the helmet. And we have 12 bolts on here that connects the corselet to the layer of rubber and the layer of canvas underneath. So how would they would actually describe this, or better yet, what they would actually call it is a four light 12 bolt helmet. And that was a quick, easy way to tell you how many vision ports and how many bolts. There are two main types of helmets like this with this style of suit, this early suit and that is the four light 12 bolt helmet and the two light three bolt, or in other cases, one light three bolt. And that would mean you'd have one or two vision ports and only three bolts holding this down. As you can guess, that was a much earlier version and not quite as secure. Going down into this, you have a weighted belt. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with diving, 
there's an issue with buoyancy. You take your weight and humans are mostly made of water. And so between the water and the air in our bodies, we like to float. You know, it's a fun little built-in safety feature of the human body. I myself like to float because I'm not the best swimmer. But you have to counteract that when you're diving. So you need extra weight to help pull you into the water and not only pull you in, but at this point in time, you needed it to keep you upright. If you did not dive upright, water would get in your suit. Uh, whereas nowadays you can, you know, flip around, swim just like a fish. Um, so while the helmet is heavy, you would have a belt, which was made of leather straps and then lead blocks. And they would attach as many lead blocks as you needed to help weigh you down. This belt that we have on display has some wooden blocks here. Um, and that's to show you what it could look like with all the lead belts, but these would be removable and actual lead. Now these two on the front and two on the back are lead. And then you would have these boots. The boots are brass on the bottom and they are a heavy, heavy brass sole that is actually nailed to a wooden insole inside the boot. And then the canvas is stretched around it. And you have these ties so that you can literally just tie them as tight as you can and try and make that as airtight as possible. So the boots weigh about 34 pounds or 15 kilograms. So that, that's a lot just to, you know, do this. Imagine uh, if you have kids or you have little cousins or you babysit, uh, you know, a lot of little kids like to sit on your feet. Imagine walking with them sitting there and you have all that weight, but it's on the toe and the bottom of your foot. So you have that weighing you down. You have the belt, which is a variable weight, and you have the helmet. The gloves would actually just be canvas. Um, and they would be, depending on the style of suit, they could be sewn on, not sewn, but like tied on, or they could be like this one, wherein we would just slide the glove on. This rubber right here is skin tight. It makes the suit airtight. And as a matter of fact, it is so tight against the skin that divers were given a team of two to four people to help them dress and someone had to actually hold open the sleeve. They would have to hold it open here to help a hand get in and out. And you can see how tiny that is. And I have tiny wrists and it just about is the size of that. So imagine um, you know, a grown man with bigger hands and bigger wrists getting his arm in and out of that. Another feature on the suit is this right here. This, now, you already saw me almost open this up. I'm gonna give you a few seconds to guess what this is. Okay, time's up. That wasn't a few seconds, that was like two. But this is a diving knife. And what this would be used for, um, you know, I, I've heard actually some jokes about you know protecting yourself against sharks and whatnot. And okay, you could do that, but the chances of getting attacked by a shark were very slim. Uh, this was usually for helping you get untangled or helping um, to break up netting and whatnot. So it had many uses. Um, if you've ever been diving or even if you have gone swimming, in the ocean, you know that seaweed itself can actually be pretty tough if it gets wrapped around you enough. Um, I'm sure all of you have come across some kind of netting or something. And this was to keep the diver safe, but also if they were doing any sort of salvage, they would need to cut the item out. There are two types of the knife and sheath. And one of them is flat. And as you can see, this one is cylindrical. 
The benefit of having the cylindrical one is that when you're diving, you don't have to make sure it's going in flat or at a specific angle. This one, you can slide in at any angle after you're done cutting. And so no matter what angle it is, you can slide it in and then you screw it on. And this is also brass. So this adds to the overall weight that you would be carrying down with you. Now lastly, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the pump, but before I do, I wanted to show you the type of glove that this gentleman would have worn. This glove right here is made of rubber, and I forgot to mention early on that, I know I said this was waterproof canvas, after the waterproof canvas, they actually would take sheets of rubber and put them in between tan twill. So that was a later form of the suit. And right here, you know, you'd get your hand in here after, you know, many painstaking minutes, and then you would slide this up here. Now divers could go down and work barehanded. It would just be really cold. So for protection, you have this um, leather lined rubber glove and it actually just stays on. All I did was slide it on. There's um, no tie, nothing to go along with it. It just stays up there on its own because of the suction created. So they would wear this to go down and do some work. And when you come here to see it on display, I'm gonna walk right in front of this here. We actually have a canvas diving bag back here that we keep these gloves in. So you can still see them. We just wanted to be able to display and show the cuff of this suit. Altogether, the suit weighs about 190 pounds. So just, you know, Find a friend or someone you know who's about that weight, give them a piggyback ride and jump in the water. You got exactly how it feels. I'm sure there's no difference whatsoever. This right here is the pump that was used with this suit. Now there are actually two different types of pump. The earliest pump was a bellows type. And for those of you who might not know what a bellows is, imagine, um, I like to think of an organ where you see you know, the, the leather go like this to move the air, or even for a fireplace, you have the bellows that are like this, they're kind of triangular shaped, and bellows move air, um, to put it very simply. This one is a pump lever um, action type of pump. So you would have a four-man team this is very, very heavy, and it was made that way so it can't tip over. It needs to also be able to support all of the steel and iron equipment that's in it. You have a knob right here that what you would do is move it. Doesn't want to move for me today. Ah, there we go. And again, a lot of these things, they're not meant to be easy to move. Um, you don't want it easy to move because then it's easy to make mistakes or do the wrong thing, move it a little too far. So this lever right here, I just moved it over to one diver for our one guy right here. And on this side, you have two divers and you also have uh, deep water mentioned here. The maximum depth that this suit could go was 600 feet which is not deep by today's standards, but for back then, that was extraordinary. Especially in a suit that if you remember, you know, early on, you couldn't bend over. Of course, those ones, they still went pretty far down, not 600 feet. Um, this one, you could bend over, you just have all of that weight to contend with. Um, so with this, you see these wheels on the side, you would have the wheels turning and what it would do is pump air in and also help with the exhaust. So this was also equipped with a non-return valve. So if the line was cut, 
the air wouldn't just flow back in. There wouldn't be any big issue with the gas suddenly, you know, going one direction or another. But this beast would have been carted around and you'd have four men operating it. Um, I can tell you from experience with us just moving it in here, it is heavy. It took four of us to move this cabinet without the wheels on it. And then one person can move the wheel, but for safety's sake, two people really should. So it is an amazing piece of equipment, especially for its time. And, you know, in the 1940s, while going in the water and diving wasn't new, going to new depths was new. And going into the water um, with so much ability for our conflicts, for the military, that was new. It, it's sort of, you know, we've had people in the military swimming for, you know, as long as people have been in the military, but this really added a different level to it. And it helped with jobs in Mishawaka and, um, you know, just keep in mind, this was built in Mishawaka. And we tend to think of this area as, you know, a little smaller in the scope of the world, but to know that US rubber um, was the key producer in the 1940s of these suits is pretty amazing to me. Um, a lot of people were reliant on them. So next time you're here, I hope that you stop by and you see this suit and I hope you're in as much awe with it as I am. I just think it's a really neat piece of equipment.